First thing we'll do together is get our Bibles, and we will turn to the Gospel of John and uh, chapter 4. So John chapter 4 is where we'll begin together in our call to worship here in just a moment. Uh, Hopefully on your way in, um, you got a bulletin, or if you're watching with us online, you've got the app, and the bulletin announcements will be available there. I just want to highlight about four things with you uh, as we get started, and the first is that Vacation Bible School is five weeks from today. We're going to start on Sunday, June the 5th, and that'll run through uh, the Thursday evening. And so registration is now open. Registration is live for children and for volunteers. And so you can go online, you can go on the app and, uh, and register. I, wanna, I do want to say one thing specifically about VBS, and that's the last couple of years that we've been able to do VBS, I've just noticed a little something. I like to teach the Bible story, and uh, the children will come in. They're always so full of energy, which is awesome. And I've noticed when I'm standing in front of them and take my Bible and open it, I don't know how to say it other than it's just been an unusual attentiveness. An unusual attentiveness among the children for the things of God, like a hunger, a, a desire. Now, um, I get the opportunity to go to a lot of different places and stand up and open the Bible. And I just say, if occasionally, I'll do that. And I can tell that, not here, other places, people are just kind of ready for it to wrap up. You know what I mean? Just like, we're ready to just go on. It's not been that way. It's not been that way at Vacation Bible School. And I'm telling you that so that you'll help me invite children, go in and register your children. It's just so helpful. The earlier you do it, it's so much more helpful to give us more lead time and how to set up and all that. And and then I'd encourage you if you're um, able to come and and volunteer, I'm asking you all here on the front end, when you're hearing, they need volunteers for VBS. Don't let it go in your mind. I'll just let somebody else do it. We need you. We need you to help. Uh, there are seasons to life. And uh, once a season of life has passed, you don't really get it over again. You know what I mean? And childhood is one of those seasons where there's sensitivity. That's what I'm trying to say to the things of God among our children. And, and you don't want to miss it if you're uh, going to be a, be a volunteer. So we need volunteers to help with crafts, games, snacks, tour guides who go around with the kids. Um, and, and so I want you to know that VBS begins five weeks from now and would love for you to, to be a part. Church Family Meal is today. Um, we called it scheduled to unscheduled time. I know that doesn't make any sense, but we're offering as a church family something that's kind of rare in the world today, and that's unhurried time, to have these things called conversations. You remember those? There's, there's, there's something we can develop around the dinner table that we can't de- develop anywhere else. And so, so you're invited today. If you haven't signed up, you can go on and sign up today. And what we ask you to do is, uh, is to bring something with you, a side or a, or, or a, a dessert, or uh, if you're up for the main course, you, you, can, you can bring that. And uh, then around the church building, we'll have different things set up, cornhole and basketball, of course, and some things like that. But um, life is lived at such a hurried pace that we're setting aside time that you don't have to rush off. So we're starting at five. When's it going to end? I mean, certainly by midnight, I would guess, but uh, we're, not, we're not making a cutoff. Uh, and, and then I also want you to know about new members class. That's Sunday, May the 15th. Belonging to a church family is so important. So if you're interested in being a member here, uh, please plan to come. You can sign up for that online as well. And uh, that's a starting point. Uh, if you, if you want to be a member, uh, we're going to cover the who should join, when you should join, how you should join, and most importantly, why you would want to be a part of uh, a, church, a church family. Well, speaking of the importance of belonging, John chapter 4, verse 27. I know we've been a couple of weeks as we've been reading through John's gospel on this particular scene of Jesus with the woman on the well. We don't want to rush through it because I think what happens in her life is so important for us to see. So uh, beginning in verse 27, just then his disciples came back. 
They marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, come see a man who told me all I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do not say there are yet uh, four months, then comes the harvest. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who, uh, who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and the other reaps. I sent you to reap for that which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told them all I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we've heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. After the two days, he departed for Galilee, for Jesus himself had testified that a prophet was no, has no honor in his own hometown. So he came to Galilee. The Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast, for they too had gone to the feast. Now here's our call to worship from the scripture. I think it's true for all of us that there are certain things about us that we don't want anyone else to know. It's likely you've got some things in your life. And even those who know you well don't know that. But God knows the real you. Why is she coming to the well at noon? Because there are certain things she doesn't want to talk to, talk about with anybody. And then she arrives. Guess who's there? Jesus. It's, first reading, it's a little bit of a strange testimony, isn't it? Come see someone who knows all I ever did. You probably never heard a testimony like that, right? What is she saying? Everything I was afraid somebody would know about me. He knows about me. And he didn't discard me. He didn't shame me. He didn't roll his eyes at me. He didn't say, you got to get your act together. Come see somebody who knows everything about me and loves me. And Jesus said, that's my food. That's, that's what I have an appetite for. So I'm going to invite you to stand and... Uh, Here's the call to worship about Jesus. Jesus brings help and healing. Jesus brings help and healing to the most sensitive areas of my life. Would you pray with me? And as we pray about that, I'm going to ask you to really think about that, to trust that that's true. Come see a man who told me all I ever did. Father, you know all about us. We open up your word so that we can know all about you. And what we can learn about you, you are a good God, you're merciful and compassionate. But above all things, you're holy. And it is true that, that, that the Lord Jesus knows all about the woman at the well, just like he knows all about Nicodemus. And he loves them. And therefore, as we keep reading the gospel of John, he is going to go to the cross to pay for their 
sins, for the things that he does know about them. And that's where real healing comes, real help comes for our lives. So, Father, I thank you for Jesus. Pray as we sing, as we open up your word, as we study the scripture, as we talk about offering and missions, that we are a people who have anchored our hope in the Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. I want to share with something with uh, you guys real quick. This past weekend, we had uh, participated in Secret Church, and David Plant told this story about a church that he knew of uh, in the Middle East, and these brothers and sisters in Christ would gather at night, staggered. They would arrive at the, the house they were meeting in staggered, so nobody would know they were meeting. And when they got there, they would send one person out into the hills to get the one Bible that they had to read together. They would gather together, read it secretly, quietly, whispering to one another for hours. And then before the sun came up, they would take the Bible back and bury it until they could meet the next time. And for us to be able to gather here today and to say, our circumstances don't dictate the joy that we have in Christ, clearly. Our brothers and sisters on the other side of the world who are meeting in secret and we get to gather here that we have joy because of who we are in Christ and what he has done for us. So we're going to sing today, um, House of the Lord. And we'll sing that chorus together. There's joy in the house of the Lord. So I want to invite you to sing this with us. We worship the God who was, we worship the God who is, and we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors and he parted the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory. Yeah. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today. Shout out your praise There's joy in the house of the Lord Our God is surely in this place We won't be quiet We shout out your praise We shout out your praise We sing to the God who heals We sing to the God who saves Sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross, then he rose up from that grave. My God, still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the Surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. And we were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Sing it out. Lord, today. 
darkness we were waiting without hope and without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt the laws to redeem the whole creation you did not despise the cross for even in your suffering you saw to the other side knowing this was our salvation Jesus for our sake you died That stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death. And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe. For the souls of all who'd come to the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was born, then the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel and shall not faint. By his blood and in his name and in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ who is resurrected me. Amen. So we praise his name. Praise the Father. Let's um, read God's word together and continue to worship him and hear from him. Jeremiah chapter 17. And we'll read together verses 5 through 14. So Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 5 through 14. Thus says the Lord, cursed, cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He's like a shrub in the desert, shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness, in an uninhabited salt land. 
Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, who, whose trust is in the Lord. He's like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream, does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green, and is not anxious in the year of drought, for he does not cease to bear fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. Like the partridge that gathers a brood that she did not hatch, so is he who gets riches but not by justice. In the midst of his days they will leave him, and at his end he will be a fool. A glorious throne set on high from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be put to shame. Those who turn away from you shall be written in the earth, for they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living water. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for you are my praise. Let's pray together. Father, according to your word, there's, there's a way that we would live that would be cursed. And there's a way that we live that would be blessed. And it's about who we trust in. So give us grace to understand your word and uh, receive what it is that you would say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Of course, you may be seated. The title of this morning's message is The Most, the most Deceitful Thing of All. Have you ever trusted somebody only to find out that they were not actually trustworthy? Has that ever happened? Or have you ever put confidence in somebody and what they were saying, but found out later that they were lying to you? Have you ever been deceived? One of the times that I remember most being deceived happened when I was about 11 years old. I was raised, y'all, by a frugal man. You know what I mean? One of, one of the clearest memories I have of my dad growing up is we would go to the grocery store, and when we got in and all us boys had unloaded the groceries, he would get the receipt, and he would sit down at his calculator, one of the old school ones with the spool, and he'd start to punch things in. And he did that every time, and never once was he satisfied with the result. He'd always say something like, it's always the cantaloupes. I don't know what the deal is with the cantaloupes, but 12 cents too much for the cantaloupes. And, and I sort of, I think I actually voiced it at one time. I said, Dad, it's, it's just a dime. And he said, son, it might be just a dime to us, but if they do that to everybody, that ends up being a lot of money. He just thought he was always getting gypped. And that created tension in our house when there was something that I wanted. Because I knew with my dad, it was never going to be, hey, I'd like this, and it was going to be an okay. It was always going to be, well, in this instance, well, um, you might remember this back then. We would receive things in the mail called catalogs. Do you remember these? The big stores would send them out, and in this case, J.C. Penney sent us the catalog. Barely could fit in the mailbox. I was thinking about this this week. I, I don't know how they mailed that to everybody. Like, how did that logistically work? How did they fit all of those? In the, anyway. Not the point, but I was looking at the catalog and I, was always, I would always go to the sporting goods section and there was an advertisement for a coat, a San Francisco 49ers jacket. And when I saw it, I just, I just said, I've got to have that. 11 years old, sixth grade, but I knew I was going to have to go talk to my dad about it. He was not in the least influenced by advertisements. It's 1990, the story, he was wearing the same clothes he had worn in 1970. I mean, it was just, he got it, it fit, he stayed with it. He cared nothing about fashion. Usually if I'd ask him I need something, he'd say, well, we'll go to Montgomery Ward. I'll just tell you, not everybody at Benvenu Middle was wearing the Montgomery Ward wardrobe. But I really, I really wanted the coat. So I went to him and I said, Dad, 
Can I get this jacket? His response was, and I knew this is what he's going to say, don't you already have a jacket? Technically, the answer was yes. I did already have a jacket. It was handed down to me like most of my other clothes from my older brothers. It's always where my jackets came from, but this one would be mine. And then, as I just said again, well, I'd really like this. My dad ended the conversation this way. Huh. That's, that's, that, I knew the conversation was over. It was, it was a noncommittal groan huff, and I closed it up and tried to forget about it. But man, I really wanted that jacket. Well, weeks later, my dad picked me up from school, and instead of going home, we went to J.C. Penney, parked the car. He said, let's go in here. So I followed him in, and we walked up to the customer service counter. He talked to the person standing there, and she went to a back room. I didn't have any idea what was going on, and then came out carrying a package. He handed the package to me, and we walked back to the car, which he'd also been driving since 1970, and got in it. And he said, why don't you go in and open it? And I tore into the package, and there it was. That San Francisco logo looking up at me. I couldn't believe it. I was shocked. And he had this little smile on his face because he knew I never expected him to get that for me. And I tore it open and I pulled it out. But then my heart sank because in the catalog, the way the picture was framed, it looked like this durable, sturdy, can last a lifetime jacket but I was holding a thin, wispy windbreaker. I've been deceived. This isn't necessarily a commentary on J.C. Penney. All of a sudden, I'm saying, I shouldn't have said, you know, you know. Everybody does it, right? Some deceptions lead to disappointment. Other deceptions in your life can lead to absolute disaster. Look at Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 19, or verse 9. The most deceitful thing of all. Look what the Bible says, because you don't hear this outside the Bible. We'll talk about that in a moment. But you, you actually hear the opposite of this. So here we go. The heart is deceitful above all things and not sort of, desperately sick, who can understand it? Now, just real quick, if we were to take Jeremiah 17, 9 and do a little fill in the blank, and I just stood before you and I said, you fill in the blank. The blank is deceitful above all things. If you hadn't already read this verse and already said, well, I know what the Bible says, but if, you just, if I just asked you, what's the most deceitful thing of all, what would you say? Maybe you'd say, the world, the enemy, the government, somebody's name he would fill in the blank. But would anybody say, my own heart, my own heart is the most deceitful thing of all. Now, I might not say that, but do you see where we started? Verse 5, thus says the Lord. And it's not just, y'all, it's not just that we wouldn't say my own heart is the most deceitful thing. It's not just that. We've, we think our heart is the most trustworthy thing. How many times have you ever heard somebody say, well, you just need to follow your heart. You just need to follow your own heart. So knowing that hardly any of us would say, my heart is the deceitful thing, and most all of us would say we should follow our heart, we can begin to see how effective the deception is, can't we? So we'll start here. Is trusting your own heart is the cursed life. Trusting your own heart is the cursed life. Now, uh, Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 5, thus says the Lord... Cursed is the man who trusts in man. You just gotta, gotta believe in yourself. You just gotta trust yourself. You just gotta follow your heart. God said that's cursed and makes flesh his strength, whose heart, 
turns away from the Lord. Here's what God says will happen. You'll be like a shrub in the desert. Shall not see any good come. Shall dwell in parched places. A little bit later on when he describes the blessed man, he says that man is, uh, does not fear when heat comes and is not anxious in the year of drought. So, uh, and, and his fruit does not cease. So when you trust in yourself, according to this passage, you're cursed, parched, anxious, fruitless. That's how God describes us. I was reading a book this week by an author named Alan Noble. He was talking about a a phenomenon called zoocosis. And zoocosis is the repetitive, invariant behavior of an animal in captivity with no obvious goal or function. And specifically, he talked about a lion in captivity. If you watch it, it'll just start to pace back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Repetitive? Doesn't seem to be any purpose behind it. It's not accomplishing anything. And as they've studied it, trying to figure out what goes on, the lion has zookeepers working hard to recreate his natural environment, right? I mean, they've studied it. But no matter how hard you try to recreate the lion's natural environment, the lion still has people staring at it all day, right? Still smells hot dogs in the air. Still sleeps in an artificial cave. Its, its meals are scientifically engineered to meet the lion's dietary needs, but can't satisfy his desire to hunt. The lion's overseen by experts. They know all about his diet and habitat. But they know more about the lion than the lion knows about itself. And yet, pacing back and forth, back and forth. Why? Because no matter what adjustments are made by the zookeeper, the lion does not belong there. And you and I were not made for the environment that has no reference to God. Not made for that. It's inhuman. You were made to have an abiding relationship with God. You might not pace, 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 but do you scroll, 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 repetitive, cursed, parched, anxious, fruitless. The heart is what we're talking about. Whose heart turns away from the Lord. The heart is deceitful. So let's just talk for a minute about your heart. You know, the proverb, above all else, guard your heart, for from it flow all the wellsprings of life. In other words, if your heart is desperately sick, everything in your life is desperately sick. It's with your heart you get your sense of identity. It's with your heart that you make decisions. It's with the heart that you shape your friendship. The heart determines how you approach education, how you pursue a job, how you pursue a career, how you think about romance, how you think about marriage, the way you're going to parent, how you deal with conflict, how you handle stress, how you handle failure, how you use your money, where you look to for fulfillment, how you deal with media and entertainment. The heart is everything. And when the heart turns away from the Lord and in essence says to God, I got this, don't need you, we're good, parched, anxious, fruitless, shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. The heart is deceitful and the biggest lie the heart says goes like this. This is the lie that all the other lies come from. I belong to me and nobody can tell me who I am or who I should be. It's the biggest lie there is. It's the lie that says, I don't have to give an account to God or anybody. Our baby in our house is about seven weeks old. And you know, it's been an awesome seven weeks. 
But that baby didn't call herself into being. Did you know that? You know that. Wasn't her idea to show up. But we get this idea in our minds, in our heart. Where did it come from? It comes from us. We tend to think the most dangerous lies are out there. The Bible says the most dangerous lies are actually in here. I belong to me. So referring back to Alan Noble again, he says, when you believe you belong to you, when you believe with all your heart that you and you alone define your identity, you choose your own values, only you can set limits on what you can do. No one else has any right to influence your right to define yourself, to choose your journey in life. Isn't that, isn't that, now I've been raising kids for a little while and going to be doing it for a little while. Isn't that the theme of every movie and TV show, children's movie there is? It goes like this, whatever the title is, the hero, the heroine, the whole plot line is that he or she has to sort of throw off all rules and expectations of everyone else in the family or on the island or in the house, defy behavioral norms, sexual norms, gender norms to unlock your, here's the key, real and authentic self because self-discovery is the new salvation. And hang with me, if self-discovery is the new salvation... Self-expression is the new worship, and the lack of affirmation of myself is persecution. And friends, that's 2022. That's where we are. And the prophet saying then but still now is, that's deceitful. Even, here's, the, here's where it gets interesting, the days we live in. There's noble notes Even when we discover our true self, and remember, you're the only one who can define what that means, so you've taken that power into your own hands, or create our own identity, we still need some kind of external validation, so we must express ourselves a process called expressive individualism. We are our own, we belong only to ourselves, But identity requires the acknowledgement of other people. And there's where the tension is, right? In our culture. It's it's strange but true that no one can tell me how I am to live, but everyone needs to affirm how I live. And to quote him one more time, the terrifying thing is that everyone else in the society is doing the exact same thing. Everyone is on their own private journey of self-discovery and self-expression so that at times, modern life feels like billions of people in the same room shouting their own name so that everyone knows that they exist and who they are, which is a fairly accurate description of social media. It's what happens when you're told to look in your own heart, to look within for meaning and purpose. Cursed, parched, anxious, Fruitless. Usually doesn't start out that way, by the way. Got to walk into that desert a little while before you realize there's no water here. So we're not made to live like this. We've been studying and reading through the Gospel of John on Sunday mornings. You see how this works. Nicodemus, what was his identity? I got my act together. I'm the reliable one. I'm the trustworthy one. I'm the moral one. I'm the teacher of Israel. And then he walks into the presence of Jesus, and Jesus looks at him and says, unless you be born again, you can't enter the kingdom. You want to talk about deceit? Deceit is trusting yourself while saying you trust God, but really trusting yourself. And that's who Nicodemus was. That's a trap millions of people get into. Well, I really follow the Lord. Do you follow the Lord? Or have you decided who you think God should be and then you're following that God that you made? That's what Jeremiah says on almost every page, isn't it? Or the woman at the well. Man, she was looking for her identity. If I could just find the right guy. But we're not made to live like this. Do you wake up and think, I just have to get through the day and never This is the day the Lord has made. 
I will rejoice and be glad in it. And God makes it in Christ that you can flourish, not just sort of survive. So if, if you resolve to follow your own heart, that meaning, identity, purpose come from within, you say, well, you said that it's parched places. And in parched places, you'll do just about anything to get relief. Some people, it's to binge watch Friends or The Office for the 12th time. Or immerse yourself in the 24 hours news cycle. Or immerse yourself in video games or porn. Or turn to exercise as salvation or health as your identity. Look to the politics to give you hope and a cause for life. Or immerse yourself in the stock market, or I'm going to travel the world, or work 80 hours a week, or have an affair, or whatever your heart tells you to try next. Heart is sick. Who can understand it? If you believe that you belong to you, and no one can tell you what to do, most people today believe that. And how are we doing? If this were salvation, the more people who believe this way, wouldn't we see levels of joy and peace and contentment skyrocket? Is that what we're seeing? We're seeing the very opposite. Because a person and then a generation who says to the Lord, we don't need you, shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness You know, materially speaking, for the most part, our generation is doing better than any generation in the past. And that's the only way we're doing better than the people who've lived before. Emotionally, spiritually, mentally. mm -mm. Because it's a deception. It's a false gospel. Well, thankfully, there's more to say, amen. Amen. Turning to God leads to the blessed life. That's the second point. Blessed. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, who trusts, whose trust is in the Lord. Now, he's like a tree planted by water that sends out its root into the stream. It does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. Well, we see the contrast, obviously, between the cursed life and the trusting, or the blessed life, rather, and the common uh, verb between the two is trust. Cursed is the man who trusts in man. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. Now, it's 2022. Uh, Many of you have been around church and hear sermons like this a thousand times. So so instead of it becoming white noise, I want to really talk about what you really do trust in. Because a common scenario in our day is to be able to say all the spiritual things while functionally, like how you're actually living your life, it's not as unto the Lord. So I'm just going to ask you a series of questions that I've found helpful to receive input from outside of yourself to help discern your true self. Because here's the deception of the heart. Here's what, and, and the, man, this gets so uh, convoluted, but this is what happens, is most of us can sit here and hear this and say, yeah, that's true for them. But I'm a little smarter than that. What is the heart? De- who, it, who is the heart deceiving? You. Whose heart? Your heart. Isn't that tricky? You're, you're, tricking your, you're deceiving yourself. You're constantly giving promises to yourself that maybe at another part of yourself realizes, I'm not going to be able to keep that promise, but I'm going to keep making it because I've got to get through the day somehow. So, Paul Tripp, uh, uh, one of my favorite authors, has a series of questions in one of his books, and it's just helpful to discern your true self. So here, here's one question. We'll just start with this. Where, now, before the Lord, you got to be honest. You remember the heart's deceit. So answer it honestly, not what you think it should be, but where do you experience the biggest moments of happiness in your life? What are those moments? And your darkest moments of sadness. 
you, you can begin to really discern what your trust is in on the basis of your greatest joys and your greatest griefs at the same time, right? That's what, uh, uh, what you're trusting in is the source of your greatest joys and your darkest moments, right? So if it was money, that's what you're trusting in. Your greatest joys is when the bank account or the 401k or the retirement says this and your greatest sadness is you look at, man, there's the stock market, right? Or maybe, maybe it's another person. Maybe it's a romantic relationship and greatest joys you've got in life right now is and the darkest moments is if it does it. So what angers you? Or crushes you with disappointment? What is it that motivates you to keep going or makes you feel like quitting? What do you tend to envy in the lives of other people makes you feel jealous or, or bitter? Or what makes you feel like life is worth living? We've done one fill in the blank, let's do another. When you say, if I only had this, my life would be thriving. What are you willing to really make sacrifices for? Now, if you think and give honest and humble answers to these questions, do they have more to do with the kingdom of God or the kingdom of self? Because my discernment a little bit is in our day, we're trying to take a little bit of self-fulfillment gospel and the real gospel and mash them up a little bit. So that my self-fulfillment, what I really want, oh, that's what God wants, it's everywhere, y'all. We're going to talk about this more in the weeks to come just so we can expose some false teaching. Because false teaching, in Jeremiah's day, we've been studying it. What do they say, man, the shepherds? God says, the shepherds are talking to you, but they're not listening to me. If anyone would come after me, do you know what the first thing the Lord says to do is? Let him deny himself. That doesn't sound like self-fulfillment, does it? Let him actually deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Because the Christianity is not about God kind of coming alongside the life you were going to live anyway. And just putting a little spiritual cherry on top. It's about denying self, taking up the cross, following him. And he says, for whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses it for my sake will actually find it. Now, we live in a generation that tells you to deny yourself nothing. That's what leads to life. And that's exactly opposite of what Jesus said. Denying yourself and dying to yourself. And then you will actually have life. Well, Jeremiah, last point here is, is that only God can heal the heart. Here's the, uh, this, is the, this is the, man, this is the devastating part. It's the devastating part. Um, I think we all know something's wrong, right? I think we all know something's wrong with me, something's wrong with the culture, something's, something's just wrong. But it's two, it's two separate things to know something's wrong and then to develop how to make it right. And so false teaching thrives on saying something's wrong, but then offering you the wrong solution, right? Makes sense, of course. Only God can heal the heart. Now, a couple of deceptions that are at play quickly. It's number one to say, my heart doesn't need to be healed. I'm good. I'm good with me. I'm good the way I am. I'm going to follow my heart. And, and look at verse 14. Well, actually, <laughs> get the full picture. Let's, the heart is, verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. That's a call back to the cursed life, the blessed life. I'm going to give you according to the way that you're living. And, and the way you're living is about not what you say, but what you do. 
If you turn away from me, you'll find parched places. If you turn to me, no matter how hot it gets, you'll not be anxious. So like the partridge that gathers a brood that she did not hatch, so is he who gets riches, but not by justice. In the midst of his days, he shall not uh, leave him. And at his end, he will be a fool. Right at the start of the new year, our family was at the beach, and it was a beautiful day. It was like the nicest day. I mean, it was a perfect day. Sun was out, but it wasn't hot. There was a cool breeze at my back. It was awesome. A couple of my children were out there. Uh, Abel brought a shovel and just started digging, 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 digging into the ground. He's making, well, making a big hole in the ground is what he's doing. Putting steps, kind of like these here, and it went down. And near, nearby, Juliana was building a sandcastle. So as he was going down, she was going up. And both of them spent like two hours on their projects. Abel got so far down in the ground, I couldn't see his head anymore, right? I could see both of them plotting and planning. Both worked up a sweat, snapped a picture of them working on their projects. And the next day, you couldn't tell any of them. Either one of them had done anything on that beach. It's it's almost like they weren't even there. Just like thousands and thousands of others. The ocean's undefeated in that regard. You know what I mean? Jeremiah uses a different analogy to say the same thing. In the midst of his days, they will leave him. And at his end, he will be a fool. In other words, you can spend your whole life digging something, building something, turning away from God. But God's the ocean. He's just got a little sandcastle. And he might have family members snapping pictures and say, way to go. You might have sweated every bit of sweat you've got, but you're building, investing, spending your life on something that at the end of it will put you to shame. Those who turn away from you shall be written in the earth. They've forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living water. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for you are my praise. That's in contrast to our day. It says either I don't need to be healed or I will heal myself. I will save myself for I am my praise. My dad and I were riding back from the J.C. Penney holding that coat in my hand and I, and I was conflicted. I'm so thankful that, I mean, if we just think about it for a moment, this is back then, we we're 30 plus years ago. Back then it wasn't Amazon click a button. It'll show up in a couple of days, right? Some of you get Amazon boxes, I don't even know what it is. I don't even remember what I ordered. It, back, back then, for that jacket to arrive, to get it out of the catalog, you had to call a phone number. You had to pick up the phone and dial. I don't know this isn't difficult, but it was time consuming. And then you'd have to tell them the item number. And it was usually a 17-digit code, you know. And if you missed it by a number, I'm getting the Raiders jacket, not the 49ers jacket. So it's important. I mean, we got to get... And, and then you'd have to send them a check or maybe a money order. Nobody's sharing a credit card number on the phone. I mean, we didn't do those things back then. And then you got to wait three to four weeks for delivery. And I know my dad. Every one of those steps are things he's like, I don't ever do this. So I think about the jacket differently now than I did then. I'd wear it every day if I still had it. Sleeves would probably come about right here. I'd wear it proudly because it came from him. See, back then, I was more focused on the gift 
than the giver, but that's all changed now. A 180. You know, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount said, Which of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Now, uh, I am a, uh, really limited in my knowledge and wisdom. But I, if it were me, man, it would eat me up. I don't know how to say it. Uh, from God's perspective, that people are in parched lands and he's getting the blame for it over and over and over and over and over. Our hearts deceived us. We don't get what we thought was coming. And then we turn and say to God, why did you let this happen? He's not the deceiver. The Bible says he can't lie. And he's not lying, by the way, when he says, if you turn away from me, it'll be parched lands. That's not a lie. That's the truth. Before you or I ever had the maturity or the discernment to ask for Jesus to come, God sent him. In other words, before we ever get to the point and said, I need you to heal me, Lord, God had already provided the healing in Christ Jesus. And Jesus, through his death, his burial, and his resurrection, what does that teach it us? He went to the parched places, friends. He went there in your place. In an uninhabited salt land. Well, here's the word for it. Cursed. So Jesus is cursed in your place so that you can be blessed. The, the storyline of God's revelation in the Bible is we turned away from him and now... We are inhabiting an environment that's not where we belong. Both in here and here. Both need to be restored. But the work begins in here. The deception began in here. So, in Christ, God has knocked every fence cage door down so that you could be liberated from the false habitat of self-salvation and restored to live life as it was meant to live. Jesus says, I came that you would have life and have it abundantly. Rescued from the parched places of the wilderness to the replenishing places, the fountain of living water. Let's stand together and we'll pray together, respond to the Lord together this morning. Do you pray with me? And then after I pray, we're going to have a time of response. If you would like someone to pray with, it would be my joy to pray with you this morning. I'm going to come to the front and Sometimes it's helpful. It's happened in my life. I just need to get some things spiritually straight in my life. Sometimes in a worship service, to come to the front, to kneel, to pray, to think. You're welcome to do that. When we turn to the Lord, we're turning to the Lord who made us, who loved us, who sent his son for us, and who welcomes those who repent and believe back to himself, restoring you to the way life is meant to live, trusting not in my own heart, but trusting in one who's greater than I am. I'm no longer going to look within. I'm going to look up. I'm going to trust in him. So, Father, I thank you for the words of the prophet Jeremiah. They're helpful to my life. Speak clearly to our generation. 
God, nobody talks to me about me more than me, and nobody lies to me about me more than me. I need one who's wise and good and gracious. I need God to speak to me. And thank you that in your word you do that. Lead our time of response, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.